I think we're live. This is me. I'm going to just check in. Let people hop on the stream here. Happy Thursday, everyone. Glad to see you here. Okay, let's see if we're live. We are. Oh, that's the wrong description. <sighs> um, okay. Let's see if I can change the description. Let's see if I can change this. All right, we got notifications. All right, let's see what happens here. Okay, hopefully that changed the description. All right, how's everybody doing? Give me a high sign that you are listening. All right. Hey, Rakita. Hey, Angela. All right. Now, I'm wondering if YouTube is working as well. Let's see it's streaming too. No. <laughs> so I haven't quite mastered how to get things to stream to YouTube. Okay. Well, we'll keep working on that. All right. How is everybody doing? Hey, Jonathan and Jenny and Margaret. Well, you guys are stuck with me. I'm the least sick. <laughs> of Monique and I still am battling a cold, but it hasn't been too bad uh, so far. So I'm still trying to fight back here and got some water to drink while I'm on the stream and got a couple of the topics planned for us. So keep praying for us. Monique is um, still very sick. So keep praying for us. Hey, Amy. And uh, going to get um, hey, Rachel, glad to see you here. Battling a cold, too. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, and the other Rachel. Great to see you both here. So while we're waiting for people to jump on here, I wanted to let you know once again that um, I my classes, my next class starts January 10th. And um, You'll be able to sign up. Just go to centerforbiblicalunity.com backslash classes. And then you'll be able to sign up. And I wanted to spend a minute talking about it. I know Amy Burks, who's on the stream, has already signed up. So this is what the page looks like. And you just go to register now right here. And then it'll take you to the registration class or form. The class is called God's Person and Word. And this is going to be the first in a sequence of three classes that I'm going to do in 2022 on theology. And um, I'm just noticing that um, there, there's, there's really no way <laughs> for people to um, figure out like who is a sound pastor or unsound pastor or sound teachings, unsound, a uh, sound book unsound book from a theological perspective without teaching people some basic theology. And really, in my opinion, this is what local churches should be doing. They should be having classes, but very few churches even have Sunday school anymore. So I'm kind of stepping into the gap. We're going to have some basic doctrine. And I know that immediately when I say um, things like we're going to have a class on theology. There's a huge percentage of people that are like, click off. I just lost interest because that is just a bunch of debating about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It's not relevant to my life. It's about as much fun to learn as watching paint dry. It has no application to my life. And I beg to differ. Um, yes, not everybody is a professional theologian, but everyone is a theologian. Even non-Christians are theologians because everybody has viewpoints about God. Everyone has thoughts about God. And so what we have to do is bring our thoughts, feelings, emotions, opinions, 
into alignment and agreement with scripture, how do we do that? So I'm going to be leading people through three classes in the next year. So the first one is God's person and word. We're going to go over the, the nature and character of God. So we'll talk about what's called theology proper, which is the, the who is God, the nature of God, um, the Trinity, um, and the doctrine of scripture, um, the origin and history of the Bible, how it was compiled, how it was put together. How do we know the Bible that we have today is the same that the Bible of the apostles so those are the big topics we're going to be covering. There's um, a few textbooks for the class. So go sign up for my class at centerforbiblicalunity.com backslash classes. And classes will begin on January 10th. So all the details are there. You can find out all about it and that sort of a thing. Okay, so let's get into our first topic tonight. Um, I'm, I made a post a few days ago over on my theology mom page and it, <laughs> I never get, I usually, I'm lucky. Usually if I get like three comments on a post, I feel like I'm, well, I'm, I'm doing big things. I got three comments. Um, but the other day I made uh, a comment about uh, churches. And I said that my frustration level was a thousand. <laughs> we have been uh, watching live streams from churches back East, trying to pre-screen some possible churches for our daughter to attend while she's away at college. And um, so if you want to read all of the comments, I got 156 comments. I was like, whoa, people are really interested in this topic. So I thought, well, all right, I'll, um, see about maybe talking about it on the family meeting. Um, and I think that we need to talk about this because we have gotten so many letters from people who have lost their church during the pandemic, or they are transitioning churches and crazy things started emerging, uh, during the social unrest last summer. And, uh, people are, looking for churches. We're not the only one um, going through this process right now. And I guess I wanted to make a few comments about this. And, uh, you know, I think the most foundational comment that we need to have is like, I I'm totally committed to attending church. Like I think attending a church is important. Um, Zoom is not a substitute for a local church. We need to, and, um, be in, in person as much as possible. Now I'm not talking about exceptions. There's always people that want to point out exceptions. What about the shut-ins? What if you're have like a disease? Like it, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in normal circumstances, you know, for the vast majority of people, we should be committed to attending a local church. Watching a live stream is not the same thing as going to church. There is an inherent need that I think God has made in all of us for the importance of healthy fellowship, um, the need for support. Like life is hard. We don't want to be alone in that. We want to have godly voices who are walking with us and helping us and sowing into us and us into them. We need people to help us with discipleship and learning and places uh, that we can go to serve others. And so I absolutely believe that being involved in a local healthy church is vital. And yet there is the reality of the struggle because it is um, just, it, it's hard. It is really hard. Cause here's what I've been noticing is we've been looking at these churches and yeah, like live streaming can be valuable to do as a preliminary search for a church. Um, and that sort of a thing. Like if you go on a church website and Monique and I did a podcast, like a really long time ago, like one of the very first podcasts we did was about looking for a church and how to evaluate a church. And so, you know, we live in a day and age where you can do some preliminary research when you're looking for a church. Uh, you can, the first step I always do when I go on a church church's website is I look for the statement of faith. How robust is the statement of faith? Is it four sentences? Is it really long? Do they list that we hold to um, 
these confessional statements, what denomination are they aligned with? Like there's some, some info there. So if I go to a, a church website and there's barely any information about what they believe, um, that's for me a huge red flag. Like I'm probably not visiting that church. Um, so go do your due diligence for, um, the, for the basics of what does this church believe? How into what they believe are they, you know, that sort of a thing. Now, I think that, um, you know, thinking about, I'm going to change the caption here. Um, when we think about things like streaming church, Tim says live streaming a church is a temporary solution to find a permanent solution. That's very well stated, Tim. I totally agree with you on that. So you can use these live streams and the benefit of these live streams for pre-vetting a church. That's, that's a great way to utilize that technology. It's also a wonderful technology for shut-ins and people who, who are disabled or can't get to church in person. Um, but again, we don't want to leave them totally behind. They need also visitation. They need a visitation program. They need real people to come be with them because there are basic human needs um, for people to feel connected to the body of Christ. So after you've kind of pre-vetted the statement of faith, the, the other place that I go is I look to see um, if the church offers classes, like what are the educational opportunities that this church offers? If they don't have something that resembles like a serious Bible study, like a verse by verse Bible study opportunity or adult Sunday school learning or a Sunday night learning academy or some type of apparatus for people to learn about their faith. If all they have are fellowship groups or small groups, that's probably not an environment where there's going to be much discipleship happening, where there's going to be thriving of, of bringing people along in their faith toward maturity. And that is uh, to me can be an indicator of what's happening in the church. Um, then I go look at the sermons. I start streaming some sermons and a quick shortcut that I've learned is go stream sermons from the summer of 2020 and the early fall of 2020. Do a search. If they have a search engine on um, their uh, streaming page or on their YouTube channel, uh, do a search for key terms like justice or racial reconciliation. See what messages they put forward during the unrest. How were they shepherding people? What was the messaging? That will give you some insight into what's happening with their leadership. Um, I think that that is a, I think that that's a, a, a really good, not a hundred percent. Again, none of these things are a hundred percent. There's always exceptions, but it's a good measuring stick. It's a good way to take the temperature. Let's say it that way. It's a good thermometer to see what is happening in that church. And when times are hard, how those, how that pastoral team is going to be shepherding people. Another thing you can look at is the leadership. How many leaders do they have? Do, is it an elder run church? Um, does it have multiple leaders or is it all kind of seem to be built around one guy? Uh, that's a really big question for the health of the church. It ought to reflect the model that um, is put forward in the New Testament of a plurality of leaders. Ideally, you want to even have a teaching team that's a plurality. So there's not just one voice that's dominating things. So those are some things to think about. Um our friend Raina, I love this comment. She says, been a long time since I've been here with you. How, glad to see you, Raina. I agree in person is vital, but you guys feel like my family as well. Oh, thank you. We love you, Raina. So uh, Raina took one of our classes um, this past year. And yeah, I think as long as you're doing the in-person thing, you know, yeah, I, we definitely want to create a family atmosphere here at Center for Biblical Unity. That is so intentional on our parts. And we know for some of you, 
like that might be your main point of of contact with people like-minded people but we really want to encourage people to get plugged into a local church and have those tangible people that you are walking um in life with because man it is life is hard like it is tough out there people are going through some things and you need some people who can uh, have your back and you need a pastor that has your back you know you need a pastor who that you can talk to and and um that or an elder team or somebody that you can get spiritual counsel from so so important um Elaine has a good question. What about churches whose website is static? I think ours is not updated with current classes because the congregation doesn't even use and check it. I would say you don't know who's then not coming because it is static. I mean, that's a great point to bring up to your to your team, your pastoral team of, hey, guys, you know, we might be missing out on some people. I'm going to tell you, if you go to a, a biblically solid church, um, there is such a need right now for biblically solid churches that you could be really doing some things to re to recruit those those orphans uh, to come to your church. So yeah, keeping that up to dating up to date is you know a, you might be missing out on some people that are looking for a solid alternative. But here's what we've been noticing when it comes to the sermons is that man, there is basically topical sermons are the number one way that, that pastors are preaching now topical sermons everywhere I go is topical sermons. And <laughs> even when you go on the sermon pages and it looks like they're doing a, a study through a book of the Bible, they're still topical. They don't, they aren't reading a lot of the verses in context. Rather, the, 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 the pastor will create a topical series on a book of the Bible and still treat it topically. And it's, it's so interesting to me because um, that is just how they go. Now, I have subscribed to a sermon farm. I despise sermon farms. I don't use sermon farms. Uh, and this is a service that churches can purchase sermons from. And uh, none of my live streams, none of my teachings have I purchased from a sermon farm. I do all my own research and I write all my own teachings. And so does Monique. Uh, we don't have sermon farms that write our blog posts. We don't have, we don't do that as a Center for Biblical Unity. Um, and I think that the dominant model though that comes from these sermon farms at least the one that i have subscribed to is again topical sermons and um last week we sat through a sermon at a church back east um and it it had the a second major issue that i'm seeing coming up which is um every sermon leads to a justice conversation it's really interesting. So this guy was doing, he started out in Matthew chapter one in, in the genealogy. And I thought, great. I love the genealogies. I think genealogies are so important. You cannot literally understand the Bible if you don't understand the genealogies. And so I'm like, okay, this, this might be something. And in a few minutes, I had my family like stop the live stream. I said, okay, I have a prediction of where this is going to go. Just based on a couple of words this guy's used. And sure enough, it exactly played out. It was like, we started out in Matthew 1, and then we were talking about social justice. And I was like, wow, this is um, so interesting because it felt like, I'll bet he's got a lot of sermons that all kind of go down this, this path. And it it's so what I'm noticing in, in these churches is that even the ones that you think are having book studies, it's still very, very topical. And um, it's so disheartening because I, I, I turned off the, the live stream last week and, you know, I, I'm just sitting there thinking like, yeah, okay, I get it. There's no perfect church, 
But my threshold is not a perfect church. That's not my threshold. My threshold is simply a church that has sound teaching. <laughs> like my threshold is a church who reads the scriptures publicly in context. Like that's a thing. Like there's 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 instructions about that from the apostle Paul. And like why don't we take the time to read the the whole chunk in context? Take three minutes at the outset of the sermon. And I, I when I ask pastor this is often they say, well, I'm just pressed for time. Okay, but you're putting your words over the words of scripture. So in the economy of what I'm pressed for time for, you're deciding that you're going to put your words as a higher agenda item than the words of scripture. I just don't know what to do with that. And so there is a church that my husband and I used to attend. And one of the things I really appreciated about it was that every week there was about five to 10 minutes of the service that was devoted to the public reading of the scriptures. They would read an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage. And the two passages would be connected so that we as a congregation got discipled into promise fulfillment, promise fulfillment history of salvation. Here's what's happening in the Old Testament. Here's what's happening in the New Testament. So if, if the pastor was primarily preaching on the New Testament passage, he would do it with an eye toward a relevant passage in the Old Testament. So we were knowing like, oh, these two things are linked. If he was primarily preaching in the Old Testament, he brought in some insights from the New Testament and we were discipled to understand these big picture connections. But that's almost never done. But I think that I just finished teaching a class called God's Big Story. And every single student in the class said they had never been instructed on how to view the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, as one big story. They had been so discipled by topical sermons, they didn't know any other way about how to interpret the Bible. And that's what I really wish there was more conversation about. And I wish that more pastors would be willing to talk about, and parents also, is what are the long-term impacts of sitting under this kind of teaching? To have week after week, month after month, year after year of topical sermons. What does that approach teach the congregation to think about God and who he is. And that's not to say that you, topical sermons are evil or you can't do them in context or biblically faithful way, but it's so rare and it's so hard to do. Theoretically possible, yes. In actuality, rare, okay? Again, there are exceptions, but the vast majority of the sermons that as we've been exploring churches, it's topical sermon after topical sermon taken out of context. One, one or two verses that the pastor lands on really uses as a launching point to get to the point that he wants to get to. And most of the conversation is about people's felt needs, becoming a better person, becoming a nicer person. And it's like, okay, but step back for a minute and, and contemplate what is the long-term impact of these kinds of sermons and what kind of modeling are we doing for people when this is their steady diet of the types of teachings that they get? Okay, I'm going to go through a few comments and then share a few more thoughts. Uh, Jeremy says, I think more important than specific classes or small groups is knowing the philosophy of how church is being intentional toward building maturity. Yeah, that's, that's my point. And I think, I guess for me, um, classes just has to be part of that on some level. Um, I like the quote by the Russian, I think he was Russian, uh, ca uh, Catholic historian, um, Yaroslav Pelikan. He says, you know, the church should, um, never be merely a school, but it should never be less than a school. And I do think that having some kind of orientation toward 
instruction is vital because biblical liter illiteracy is high right now. So I don't know how you overcome that with some kind of formal instruction. Um, yeah. Let's see what Anne Marie says. I like live stream because it's easier to review and get an overall feel. Yeah. I get asked, is this a good church? And I like to have them to watch and I will watch and then have a discussion. I agree. I mean, I think it helps to clarify, you know, options. It gives you a starting point, but then there's also the culture of the church. Like it can look great on the website, but have a, like, it can have doctrinal soundness, but then you get there and you start realizing, man, this culture is super unhealthy and toxic. You know, we've gone to a couple of those churches. Like the doctrine is, is elegant and beautiful, but the culture is so toxic. It's, it's not good. Um, yeah, it's, there's just a lot to, to think about. And so let's see, just, I was teaching young teens on temptation. They said all, they knew all that. They kind of didn't feel I could keep, I could teach anything on that. I said, well, Jesus used scripture to fight against temptation. Let's memorize some verses that you could use. Yeah. And that would be a great thing. And, and that's the battle is like, I think teens often feel like there's just nothing there. They, they, they've heard the same stories over and over again, because that's how we've conditioned them. But, but when you start getting into the deeper things, when I've taught young people, basic hermeneutics, it like opens their eyes. Like, oh, there's this whole other level here that I didn't know about. And then they can start studying the Bible in a, in a deeper way. Um, Jonathan says topical sermons get interpretation backwards. Application first, text second should be the other way around. Yeah, I mean, so many of my impression of so many of these sermons are they're an application in search of a text. Like the text is just a pretext to get to the point that the, that the pastor really wants to make. And the, the lens that's being used and people are being taught to um, see scripture through is their own personal felt needs, current events, and, and this sort of a thing. Um, hey, Alexa, uh, maybe you already talked about this, but what should we look for in a church as far as our children? Great question. Um, I think that, you know, um, I have a video on my YouTube channel uh, with some of my thoughts about the orange curriculum and Natasha Crane joins me for that conversation. I know the orange cur curriculum is wildly popular um, in children's ministries right now. I have some fairly significant concerns about it. Um, I think it's, it, it ends up being promoting just a form of secular humanism with Jesus on top. That's just my, it's just an opinion. I'm not saying I die for that. I'm saying that's an opinion. But I think, you know, getting clear on the philosophy of the children's program, you want to look for a children's program and a student ministry program where those ministers are looking at themselves as being a support system for you as the parent. They are not trying to do all the discipleship. Rather, they are coming alongside you as a parent and helping you to disciple your student and that, you know, maybe they're offering an, an environment for outreach for people to bring their friends, but that the, the focus ought to be on um, supporting you and you taking the lead in the discipleship of your children. If, if um, I, in just personal experience, I had a conversation with one of the former youth pastors at our old church and he, yeah, on paper, he, he said, yeah, I'm here to support you, but then his practices were, well, if your child discloses something private to me or to the other youth staff, we're not going to tell you as a parent. Wait, what? So if my kid has a significant struggle with suicide or drugs or something like that, you're not going to disclose that to me as the parent. And um, yeah, that was, that was a problem for me. <laughs> that was a letter. <laughs> that was a conversation. So yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. Antonia says she used to attend church. She misses the community. Just don't, yeah, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep trying. I know it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. You have to start out with that foundational commitment 
like I said at the beginning of what do you what what are you theoretically committed to? Okay, church involvement is important, and we are in that struggle too. Believe me, we have been checking out local churches here as well. So it's 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 difficult. Uh, my friend Pastor Jeremy says, from a pastoral point of view, expository teach, preaching is often times too slow to build a biblical literacy and understanding. Many years ago, we did an expository series on Matthew that took us 48 weeks to complete. Dishearteningly, for many in the congregation, they only read what we did during those 43 weeks. Yeah, I get it. And that's why a lot of pastors do topical is because you usually can get people more engaged. But I think that we've got to we've got to somehow train our people better. And, you know, what's that fine line of, well, exercise is hard. Um, so I don't want to do it, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. E expository preaching is clunky. It, it takes time, but, um, you know, I'm, I just see the effects of it. I am seeing the effects of decades of people who have, grown up under um topical preaching and it it's not good it's they, they are not healthy they're biblically illiterate they don't know how things fit together um so it's it's really hard um and i think that that uh is when you when you have this more topical approach and that's the dominant way that people are digesting the scripture, I think what ends up happening is that people ignore the boring parts of the Bible, the genealogies, which literally you cannot understand the Bible if you don't understand the genealogies. You end up preaching oftentimes kind of lowest common denominator themes of love or justice without wrestling through all the details because details don't preach well. And I am starting to believe that this long-term approach to topical preaching that people have been sitting through, like my kids growing up under that, I'm starting to seriously wonder, this would make a great uh, topic for a doctoral dissertation, if you could figure out a way to measure it, is I'm starting to think that this is a major con contributing factor to people deconstructing, is because they, they think they're leaving the faith but they've, they've never really known what the Bible was about in the first place because they've been discipled under topical preaching and they just know all of these bits and pieces here and there. And I see this day after day, the more I do these online classes, the more I am convinced that topical pe preaching is, is the long-term effects of that is fairly damaging to people's faith. Um, so I, yeah, I just, I don't know any easy way to say that it's just out there. Um, so Jeremy says we moved to a group expository that commits the congregation to reading six days a week together as a congregation. That's great. Yeah, I love the creativity there. Our Sunday sermon is based on our reading in whole or in part. We are about to finish our first time through the Bible. That's awesome. Man, Jeremy Bannister is like, he is so committed to biblical literacy and trying creative things to get his uh, congregation more engaged with the Bible in, and, and not just talking about the Bible, but engaging in the Bible. Like I see this comment all the time on social media. Like I'm seeing them right now, the version of it I'm seeing right now is what, what devotional should I use for Advent? I literally just want to type on every single one of them. Just read the Bible. Just sit down and read the Bible with your kids. Read it out loud. Discuss it together. Just read the Bible. You don't need to have a devotional. Just read the Bible, you know. But I think we're always looking for, again, a topical approach because this is how we've been discipled. This is how we've been conditioned. Now, Robin is asking I'm looking for an expository teaching church as well. Is there a database or website where it help people find them? Great question, Robin. So there's a few different databases that you can check out, but you're going to have to still have a lot of discernment. 
There's one over on the master's seminary site. So if you go on Google and you go to master seminary um, church search, and you, it should take you a direct link there. And you can see if there's a, a, a church near you where a master's seminary grad is um, heading up, you know, the teaching team. Uh, we're, we've been attending and checking out a church here locally where we got off that database and it seems fairly sound. Um, it's not a great fit for our kids because um, our daughters just really, uh, our one daughter prefers more contemporary worship and this is not that. So, but the, yeah, so the, the, wor the whole worship conversation is another whole thing. Um, but um, there's another one that I used I've been using for the churches back East that we've been looking at. Um, it, there's one through the gospel coalition. There's another one through nine marks. Um, but those can be super hit and miss. The one we, we went to last week was listed on both nine marks and gospel coalition. And it, it was so saturated with social justice things. So, you know, you just have to, um, use your discernment and, and do your due diligence. So, okay, boy, lots of great comments here. Thank you so much for the engagement. Um, I just have been thinking about all of this and, and just really reflecting on the long-term impacts of topical teaching and, you know, what that's doing to the emerging generation, but also how it's conditioned and discipled millennial parents. And I think that this is why so many of the millennial parents that I'm interacting with in my classes, they've grown up in the church, but they don't know anything hardly about doctrine. And so what people do then is they're like, well, tell me, is this teacher sound or unsound? Or is this book sound or unsound? That's not a helpful way of going through your life because it constantly creates the spirit of dependence um, to for other outside people to evaluate things. Um, you know, I don't want to do all your fishing for you. I would rather teach you how to fish. And that's why I'm teaching these classes on basic theology. That's why I have a class, two classes now on how to interpret the Bible. I'm trying to teach people how to fish. Um, okay, Amy says, not just always looking for a topical approach, but for someone who has already done the work of studying the scriptures and putting it in layman's terms, this essentially feeds into strengthening their literacy and dependence on others' interpretations. Exactly, Amy. This is exactly my point. And I just take a very different approach of I want to help equip and train people to do this for themselves. Okay, so that is some thoughts about church searches and some of the very real challenges involved in all of that. So I hope, hope you found that helpful. And um, I'm going to go to a second topic here. And as I do, I just want to let you know that our book clubs just opened up for the Center for Biblical Unity. And I want to let you know what books we're going to be doing uh, this time around. There it is. So our books that we're going to have this time around are Reading Wall Black by Esau McCauley, Compassion and Conviction by Justin Gibney, who is the founder of the AND campaign. And our first source selection is Critical Race Theory and Introduction by uh, Richard Delgado and Gene Stefancic. And um, the reason we've picked these books is because they're books that we get a lot of questions about. And we think that they're important books. We get a lot of questions about the AND campaign and how our approach to justice is similar and different from the AND campaign. So we are including that book, uh, Esau McCauley's book. Um, he's a professor at Wheaton. He's a, theolo he's a theologian. And so our friend Kevin Briggins is going to be the leader on that group. Monique and Dr. Joe Miller are going to be leading the discussion about the critical race theory book. And this is just a great textbook introduction to what is critical race theory. And um, so you can go to uh, centerforbiblicalunity.com slash book clubs, get all the information. They're all six weeks and you can click on register now and do that. So go check those out. Everything begins January, the week of January the 10th. 
So hopefully some of you will jump in on that. And um, especially if you're working, you know, in wanting to understand these things better because you're having to go through trainings in your workplace, maybe you're a pastor or pastoral leader, and you want to know if you're an elder, you know, how do I think about these books? The book groups are wonderful because our leaders will help you process the ideas through um, a historically uh, Christian lens. And, and we don't vilify the books. Like there's some th times we think like, yeah, I can agree with that. That seems biblical or here's some problems and or, here's some questions or here's some things to think about. So this isn't to vilify any books. It's just to help us be conversant, literate and fair and be able to read widely on these topics. So go check that out at centerforbiblicalunity.com slash book clubs. Okay. The second topic um, I want to cover tonight is an article that appeared on the Atlantic website. And it was from a couple of weeks ago, but I haven't had a chance to, to do a live about it. And so since I was doing the takeover tonight, I just wanted to spend a few minutes on, on this because I thought it was such a provocative article. But there's this constant narrative that I find um, that it's conservative, biblically conservative Christians who are the divisive ones. We're the ones who are too political. We're using politics to divide the church and all of this kind of a thing. And so I wanted to talk about this because I thought that this article that appeared on the Atlantic website was just a really good avatar for the conversation that I hear happening right now. It's called the Evangelical Church is Breaking Apart. And if you notice the title, I don't think you can see it probably on your screen, but in my tab at the top of the browser, what it says is Trump is tearing apart the evangelical church. Christians must reclaim Jesus from his church. And so the import of the article is to talk about how conserv biblically conservative Christians are the ones who are dividing the church. It starts off here with a story about David Platt's church. I'm not going to read that because it's not the most important uh, part of the article. Um, I'm going to skip down to the uh, about midway through the piece. And um, hopefully you can see this. And he was, the author was talking to a sociology professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, Michael Emerson. I don't know who he is. Um, so here's some, some comments related to in this section. It says, the aggressive, disruptive, and unforgiving mindset that characterizes so much of our politics has found a home in many American churches. As a person of the Christian faith who spent most of my adult life attending evangelical churches, I wanted to understand the splintering of churches, communities, and relationships. I reached out to dozens of pastors, theologians, academics, and historians, as well as a seminary president and people involved in campus ministry, all voiced concern. I think everybody can agree that the pandemic has definitely placed strain on the situation. My theory is that all of these problems were under the surface. The pandemic and the social unrest of 2020 just simply brought them out into the open. That's my theory. Um, and I th think that the question is what, what is splitting so many of our churches? And um, I think what's interesting to me is this section right here. The root of the discord lies in the fact that many Christians have embraced the worst aspects of our culture and politics. Okay, so notice how the setup is, is many Christians. Okay, who are these many Christians? When the Christian faith is politicized, churches become repositories of grace, not grievances. Okay, so notice the setup. Whoever he's going to talk about are the ones they've politicized it. They've become guided by grievances, not grace. They're the worst aspect of our culture. Um, they place where places where tribal identities are reinforced, fears are nurtured, and aggression and nas nastiness are sacralized. 
Okay, so you see the set this is a fairly negative setup. Nobody wants to be these things, right? The result is not only wounding the nation, it's having a devastating impact on the church. The historian George Marston told me that political lo loyalties can sometimes be so strong that they create a religious-like faith that overruns, overrides or even transforms a more traditional religious faith. The United States has largely avoided the most virulent expressions of such political religions. None has succeeded for very long, at least until now. Okay, so where, where is this taking us? Trump. Then came Donald Trump. When Trump was able to add open hatred and resentments to the political religious stance of true believers, it crossed a line. Tribal instincts seem to have become overwhelming. The dominance of political religion over professed religion is seen in how, many, how, for many, loyalty to Trump has become a blind allegiance. The result is that many Christians, followers of Trump, have come to see the gospel of hatred, resentments, vilification, put-downs, and insults as expressions of their Christianity, for which they too should be willing to fight. So. It's interesting to me that the setup here is clearly one of conservatives are the problem. We, if you are trying to be a biblically faithful Christian, you are part of the problem. And do you notice the conflation between those who are divisive and a political issue of Donald Trump? Well, maybe there's another possibility available Maybe we don't, um, you know, many people can have many views of Trump, but our concern, my concern, and many of the people that I talk to are leaving their local churches. It has nothing to do with Trump. It has to do with other issues. It has to do with doctrinal fidelity. It has to do with, with positions that they feel like their pastor and their, their leadership team isn't taking a strong stand on or that they're taking an unbiblical stand. And I think that it's, it's so sad that if anything, I think this article is conflating um, Trump with the politics. I'm not convinced that the, the problem is necessarily the conservatives. I think that there's definitely some, some energy behind pushing that narrative that conservatives are the problem and then associating conservatives with Trump and then Trump makes statements that, that are kind of inflammatory. And then ergo, this is where biblically faithful Christians are. But I don't think that that's the case at all. You can, you can um, have a position about an issue that has nothing to do with Trump. Trump, there's, there's things that I would agree with Trump's policies and there's places I disagree with his policies and I disagree with a lot about his character. Okay. So I don't think like that's a fair characterization whatsoever is to say that, um, you know, that's, that's the issue. Uh, I think Jonathan says it well, like Trump is, is a red herring. That's a good way of saying it. It's like, you know, a red, the fallacy of the red herring is that it gets you off the track to the major point. I think Trump is just gets us off the track. The major point, the big question is, is we want churches that are doctrinally faithful. People are leaving churches, not because of Trump. I mean, yeah, there might be some people out there, but so many of the people that write into the ministry, like I can't remember one letter in the thousands of letters we've received about pe from people who are leaving the churches. Anybody has ever told us we're leaving our church because our church isn't supporting Trump enough. I mean, in my data set, uh, you know, the author didn't interview me. That That's not the issue. The issue is, People have deep concerns about doctrinal fidelity and that what they saw last year in 2020 was their, their church leadership not guiding them through a very difficult period in a biblically faithful way. 
Um, I, I think that that is a, a, a just a yeah, a complete red herring. It is it is not the issue. The other thing that I want to um, show here, there's one more little quote I want to go over. Says here that that it's not um, not a problem limited to the faithful on one side of the aisle. This is true of both the Christian on the left and the right. So he's giving a little hat tip here um, to well, yeah, you know, Christians that are on the left, they they also have these problems. So there's a couple of sentences here to try to look balanced. I think people come to believe that they are most thoroughly and intensively catechized to believe. And that catechesis comes not from churches, but from the media they consume, or rather, or rather the media that consume them. The churches have barely better than a snowball's chance of hell of shaping most people's lives. Now, that's that's a position that I actually agree with. Um, you know, he says, they say earlier, many churches aren't interested in catechizing their people. And this is exactly goes back to my point earlier about topical messages. They instead focus on entertainment because entertainment is what keeps people in their seats and money coming in the offering plate. I actually agree with that. I think that the the lack of teaching is a major problem. And if churches don't catechize their people and if parents don't catechize their children, and to catechize is just to disciple them, to teach them the faith. The, the culture is ready, willing, and able to catechize you, your congregation, or your children. It will do it because one way or the other, people's minds are going to be shaped. They're either going to be shaped by scripture or by culture or some combination of that. And I think that that's absolutely true. The question is, is what is catechizing us? And I think that it, <clears throat> even though he only has a couple sentences there on, you know, well, yeah, this is a problem for people on the left too. Well, thank you for admitting that because it is a problem on the left. This political thing of, you know, like, well, we shouldn't be political. That's a political conversation. I don't honestly know what that means. For to tell me that to to have a conversation about my position, about human life, um, having dignity, value, and worth, and that we shouldn't kill the most vulnerable among us, being the unborn, we shouldn't just kill them on demand. And for someone to tell me, well, that's politics. We can't talk about that. That's not politics. It is politics, and it's not. That's a profoundly theological idea. The politics part of it is how do I bridge from the theology to public policy? Okay. So who cares? Who cares if that's, if that's political, if I want to um, have law enforcement go and, and try to spend efforts and resources to shrink human trafficking. I do that because it is profoundly based on a theological idea for that people shouldn't be coerced into sex slavery or any other kind of slavery. Like that's, that's, they shouldn't be kidnapped. There's, there's laws about that in, in scripture. And, and uh, yeah, I think there should be public policies about that. Was that political? Of course it, it has political import. Um, if I'm going to talk about, policies related to any number of topics to 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 say that a conversation about the traditional family or about marriage being between a man and a woman well you can't talk about that and i have literally been in meetings in conservative christian spaces and told we can't write on these topics because this is political. We can't pump out content on certain topics because this is political. The traditional human family, the traditional marriage, the, the meaning of human life. That's, that's, 
that's not political. It has political import. It has Im impact about policies. But these are deeply theological ideas. But I feel like there's this this narrative. Well, only only people who are more have more liberal social policies and advocate more liberal social policies. Then for them, what what is that? That's not political. That that's that's not a political idea. But so only if you're a biblically faithful Christian or a conservative. Only you can't talk about the policy aspect of it. That makes no sense to me. So I think that it's it's a complete red herring to say, well, you can't talk about that because that's political. That almost never happens to the person on the left. It is almost always the cons more conservative, the traditional, the biblically faithful Christian who wants to have a discussion about what Christians have always believed about X, Y, Z issue. They're the ones that are told, well, this is too political. You can't talk about it. That almost never happens for people on the left. And it's like, why not? Like, let's just have the conversation. All right. You have X, Y, Z belief that has political import. It has a policy import. Okay. Let's talk about that. What is its connection to scripture? How do you make that case theologically? How robust is that? What have Christians historically believed about that? What do the best bioethicists believe about that? How widely read are we on that issue? Okay. Jeremy, you can't make such long things. I can't comments. I can't show them on the screen. <laughs> um. However, the government has had a profound impact by stating from the beginning that church and religious affiliation was not essential, much different than the national emergency of 9-11. Yeah, things have changed a bit in 20 years, that's for sure. Rakita, this is a great comment. I left my old church because I felt stagnant, but a part of it was also that I was tired of the political messages. There was clearly a stance taken as acceptable regarding politicians and the parties. It wasn't edifying in any way. That's a great point because we have um, visited a church locally here several times that is extremely political on the right. Now, here's where I feel like the, the excess goes too far. When you have people coming into the pulpit on Sunday morning who are political candidates and they're not even Christians, where they're they're giving a, a, a message and presentation to get out the vote and they're not Christians and that there's almost no spiritual content to the messages. Now, if you want to have that conversation, maybe we can do it on a Wednesday night. Maybe we can have a back and forth and debate the points and all of that. But I think that that's when it starts to go too far. Um, and I think that that's when it truly does become political. But the left does that too. Kamala Harris during the um, election a few weeks ago reported, uh, recorded a message that they beamed into like 300 black churches where there were elections happening. And so the left does this kind of messaging too. This is not simply a conservative issue. That's my point. But but the left, if you're an, um, advocating for more liberal social policies, I don't know why, but it's not seen as being political. And so it's it's a little strange. Um, let's see. Replying to Jeremy, it is only because of our lead... Is it only because of our leaders or other factors also at play, such as in academia? <laughs> yeah, Jeremy, you're just naturally chatty. I know. <laughs> I just can't show them on the screen. Uh, oh, Rakita. See, now Rakita's bringing some facts right here. You'll never see those politicians at your church again after the election over is over. The churches are playing the, themselves by doing this. I, I agree with you. I think that this... It, it, the, the Christian vote is something that politicians pander to, both on the right and the left. They they want our votes. They see our votes as being valuable. So whether it's Kamala Harris beaming a, a message into 300 black churches or it's having a politician locally here coming to a huge mega church a few miles from my house, um, you know, because they're 
they're running for a big political office in my state, but I don't know if that person has any sort of profession of faith. Um, this both, I think, go too far. The Sunday morning is for God's people gathered and, and that should be a scriptural focus. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think that there can definitely be a conversation about Christians being too political, but I don't think that's what this article is talking about. So anyways, those are a few thoughts about that. And um, Kimberly says, and yet people fall for the pandering on both sides. They do. They absolutely do. But I just don't, I don't buy into the idea that um, we can't talk about something in church because it's political. I think Christians ought to be taught on the Christian worldview of what is the nature of life? What is the nature of being a human person? Uh, value, dignity, and worth. We should be taught about, I think to some extent, we should be taught about the value of work and what the Bible has to say about that. And then reflecting on how does this transfer into public policies? These are all appropriate discussions that I think local churches ought to be engaging in to equip and train their people, not telling them what to vote for specifically of like what check mark to build or to check, but that we're training them on the big picture items so that they can make those informed decisions. But again, takes me right back to the beginning. So many Christians don't have a robust Christian worldview. They've never been taught how theology connects and informs real life. And that's why I'm teaching a class, three classes um, in 2022 on basic Bible doctrine. Okay, family, that is it for now. I hope you found these discussions helpful and um, just kind of grease the wheels a little bit to get us thinking. Uh, neither discussion is exhaustively complete, but just some things that have been rolling around in my head. So I, um, I hope that you find it helpful and uh, we will see you next week. Hopefully uh, we'll be feeling a little bit better by then. Please keep us in your prayers. That's all. Good night and God bless.